to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist in private practice and faculty member at the University of Virginia. Each week, my guest and I talk about meaningful coincidences, serendipity, and synchronicity. We discuss synchronicity from its many perspectives, spiritually, practically, and especially today, statistically. Why? To increase your connection to coincidences so that you can benefit from coincidence awareness in your daily life. I've written a book also called Connecting with Coincidence. Put that phrase, Connecting with Coincidence, in your web browser to find my book, Psychology Today blog, website, and social media sites. If you want to know how sensitive you are to coincidences, go to my website to take the Weird Coincidence Survey. Connecting with a coincidence, synchronicity, spoken here. Our guest today is David Hand, a very special guest in my view. Uh, He is a senior research investigator and emeritus professor of mathematics at the Imperial College of London. He's a past president of the Royal Statistical Society, is on the board of the UK Statistics Authority, and is a member of the European Statistical Advisory Committee. He previously chaired the board of the UK's Administrative Data Research Network and the research board of the Data Science Institute at Imperial College. This guy knows numbers. He has written over 300 scientific papers and 30 books, including The Improbability Principle. David Hand, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to have you. Um, I've read your book a couple of times. Um, It's so well written, and uh, I like statistics. I I took uh, statistics in college, and statistics are a critical part of uh, what I'm trying to develop with coincidence studies. So it's delight, really a delight talking with you. you. Please tell us about the five strands of the improbability principle. Okay, right. So the improbability principle is like a, a rope, a, a, a rope braided together with, as you say, five strands. I call these strands laws. They're, they're laws based on solid mathematics, solid probability theory. Um, I can go through them one at a time if you like. The first please, one. Please, please do, think? and maybe, okay. um, maybe as you, before you begin, or as you're talking about it, what what made you want to create this uh, this book yeah. and uh, the yes. strands of the improbability theory? Right. I mean, that that obviously is the right place to start. I think uh, what made me want to write the book and, and develop this theory was what in, interests you uh, about exactly the same subject. Coincidences are intriguing as we go through life these things which we don't expect to have any sort of apparent causal link come together and you think, wow, what's the chance of that? Isn't that amazing? Must have some meaning, you think. And so what I wanted to do was dig down into that to try to understand what was going on, whether there really was meaning behind these coincidences or whether we should, in fact, expect such things to happen by chance. And then on top of that, to understand how the sort of human mind, how our perceptions and understanding um, interacts with the, with the sort of mathematical basis. So yes, really, yes. it was it was the need to understand these amazing and exciting sort of events, which happen to all of us. Yes. The, the more I talk about the book and give talks on it, the more I find people coming up to me, emailing me afterwards. You know, this happened to me. Isn't it incredible? How can you explain this? What, what does it mean? That, that sort of thing. It yes. happens to all of us. Yes. Um, OK, so, so the improbability principle has these five strands, these five laws. Um, the first one, uh, and, and I have to say, sort of parenthetically, I think if anybody else was trying to write down the mathematics of improbability, they'd basically come up with the same, they may not come up with exactly the same laws, but they would describe the same space that I've described with these laws. Having said that, I think most of them would come up with the, the first one and, and in probably exactly the same words, which is what I've called the law of inevitability, which basically says one way of putting it is that that something must happen so for instance in the book i say that if you hit a a, um a golf ball onto a onto the green you know you you don't know which blade of grass it will land on but you know it will land on some blade of grass um 
it's inevitable that it will land on one. There is there is going to be one of the things is going to be uh, uh, one of the outcomes must occur. It's inevitable. And a very simple example of this would be when you're tossing a coin, uh, the coin's going to come up heads or it's going to come up tails or perhaps it would land leaning against a fold in the rug or something like that so that it's on edge or it's caught by a passing bird or something. I'm going to call all those sorts of things other. So there are three possibilities, heads, tails or other. And it is inevitable, it is certain that one of those three things must occur. That's the law of inevitability. Something must happen. I, I should say that you can take advantage of these laws once you understand them. Um, uh, and that one in particular, you can take advantage of to win the lottery. And perhaps we could come back to that later. Because yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. The second law is the law of truly large numbers. And I think this is the one when when statisticians hear that I've written a book on this, this is the one they expect the book to be about. Mm -hmm. um, the law of truly large numbers is different from the statistician's law of large numbers. Which oh, says yeah. That, yeah. If, if you if you have a sample of things, the average of that sample, the bigger the sample you take, will get nearer and nearer to a constant value. The law of truly large numbers <laughs> says basically with enough opportunities Anything, no matter how tiny its probability, is almost certain to occur if you give it enough opportunities. Um, so, and, that, and that's the key phrase, the enough opportunities. Because exactly. one of the, the questions that I even see you raise in your book is just how big is big enough for <laughs> truly large numbers? And you didn't have an answer for that. You seem to be musing about it. And that's what I want to maybe get back to after you go through the strands is just yeah. how large is large enough. OK, yeah, that's, let's come back to that. That's, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, so, for instance, just to give a, a simple example of the law of truly large numbers, the chance of um, being struck by light, being killed by a lightning strike around the world is, is very small. It's um, about one in 300. That in the course of a year, it's about one in 300,000. It's tiny. Um, but when you bear in mind that there are seven billion people in the world, that's a lot of opportunities for somebody yes. to get killed by a lightning strike. Yeah. And when you do the maths on that, putting those two numbers together, you find that you'd expect a lot of people to get killed by lightning strikes each year. And indeed, about 20, 25,000 people per year do get killed by lightning strikes. So a tiny chance of it happening to any one individual. But with with seven billion individuals, you'd expect it to happen. And, 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 and you're raising another question for me that I hope we'll get back to is you can determine the base rate uh, for uh, being struck by lightning as one of 300,000. But some events are so, so odd that it's difficult to define the base rate for them. That's absolutely right. Um, I often talk about, and I will doubtless over the course of the next hour, talk about lotteries in the yes. context of the improbability principle. And the, one of the reasons I talk about that is because it's easy to determine the base rate. We yes. can actually work out the chance of someone yeah. winning. We can work the probability out. But exactly yes. as you say, being struck by lightning or having an asteroid hit you or whatever, meteorite hit you, um, it's very difficult to work out those sorts of probabilities. And all you can do is to give a, a pretty loose sort of range um, I, I said about one in 300,000 uh, people killed by lightning per year. But, um, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very rough approximation. Um, so the third law is the law of selection. Um, this thing says you can make things as likely as you want. Or one way of putting it is you can make things as likely as you want if you choose after the event. And the simple little sort of caricature example I give of this is one that I think people, listeners will be familiar with. You're walking along a country lane and you come across a barn. And on the side of the barn, you see a lot of painted targets with arrows sticking right in the center of the target. And you think, wow, this guy's a really hot archer. And then you carry on walking along the country lane and you turn back to look at the other side of the barn. And what you see there is a lot of arrows sticking in the other in the side of the barn and a man with a pot of paint painting targets around them. That's a really good one. Yes. <laughs> He's choosing his data after the fact, um, so he can make it as probable as he likes. He can make it certain that he will get the arrows in the center of the target. Actually, I must just tell you uh, another story, which is very similar, but which, which is not a sort of imaginary one like that, but is absolutely true. About 100 years ago, the um, First World War was raging, and aircraft were being used in, as, as potential weapons of war for the first time, and they were experimenting with how you can use them. And um, one of the weapons they experimented with was bundles of 
pencil sized metal darts that they would drop on troops below from the aircraft. Um, and they wanted to know how this potential new weapon would behave. So they carried out a number of experiments. What they would do is fly over a field, drop a bundle of these darts, which would spread out and stick in the field below. And then they went around putting squares of white paper on where the darts have fallen so they could see how they how they've dispersed, how they've spread over the field. After one of these experiments, this is a true story, a cavalryman rode up and asked them what they were doing. And when he was told that there was a metal dart dropped from an aircraft right in the center of each of the paper, pieces of paper. He said, wow, I didn't think you could be that accurate from an aircraft. <laughs> but yeah. of course, he's choosing, they're choosing the data after the fact. Yeah, and we have so, about a minute left on this segment. Okay. Then I've got two others, the law of the probability lever and the law of near enough. The law of the probability lever says, with slight changes, you can make highly improbable events almost certain. The law of near enough says events which are sufficiently similar are often regarded as identical. And I can give you some examples of those later on. I think that particularly the law of near enough is one that I wrestle with a lot is mm. how do you do how do you define similarity? I mean, there are computer programs that are being able to do that, but we'll come we'll come back to those two questions. You are listening to Connecting with Coincidence with your host, Bernie Beitman, MD. I'm, that is me on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. And our guest is statistician David Hand. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand worldwide and more does this sound like tomorrow's television well it is but you can have it today right now it is simul tv simul tv offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like x-zone sci-fi and horror we are worldwide no other provider offers that 500 built-in video games no need to have an extra expensive system we have them included free video on demand live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today, Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Well, 
Welcome back to CC uh, with uh, BB. Our our guest today is David Hand, author of The Improbability Principle, and we are going through the five strands of The Improbability Principle, and we have just touched on the last two. David, would you please expand on the last two of these principles? Yeah, so, so the law of the probability lever uh, says you can make... Um, highly improbable events, almost certain if you make slight changes to them. Um, one of my favorite examples here is, is um, the Titanic. We all know about the unsink unsinkable ship, the, the, the Titanic, um, which actually sunk. And the reason it was said to be unsinkable was because it had, it had double hull. It had 16 compartments separa separated by water, watertight bulkheads. And the argument was that if one of those compartments got damaged and flooded, the ship could continue to sail. If several of them got um, damaged and flooded, it wouldn't sink. So it was regarded as unsinkable. That model's perfectly fine. The probability of this ship sinking is tiny because of, of, because of the way it was built. But what they didn't take into account was that the circumstances weren't quite like I've described. When a ship like the Titanic is hit by an iceberg, both of them are massive objects. So they don't just hit and bounce off each other. What happens is what actually happened. The iceberg gouges a great scratch along the side of the ship. It doesn't just rupture one of the compartments. It's likely to rupture the next one and the next one and the next one. And that's exactly what happened. Five of the compartments were ruptured and flooded uh, as a consequence. Well, we all know what the consequence was. But the point here is that the fundamental model, the fundamental model said if one of them's like compartments is flooded, Another one, there's no special reason why another one should be flooded. They're independent, but that's wrong. They are, in fact, dependent. If one's flooded, it's very likely because of the nature of icebergs and so on, then the next one will be flooded and the next one and so on. And that slight change to the circumstances or the model, um, um, well, we saw the consequences. It changed something from a tiny probability to a very big probability. Yeah, um, and, and I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to deviate and come back to another idea that talking about the Titanic des describes. And I thank you for the detail on that. I hadn't really heard it. I don't know that I saw it in your book, but it's a it's a great description of the folly of men trying to think of that they know what they're they're able to do and the arrogance that comes with that. Are you familiar with the book Futility written by Morgan Robertson in 1898 that seemed to predict um, the the tragedy of the Titanic it even had in it a, the, a luxury liner called the Titan and it was ah, touted. I, yes, I've heard of this because that's another wonderful coincidence. Isn't it, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It, it was touted as being unsinkable as you, the ship yeah. was struck yeah. by an iceberg with much loss of life. And there were a lot more details in the book that came close, not the same, but very close to the size and tonnage and square footage and all kinds of other things that, and a lack of lifeboats um, that very much resembled what actually happened. So that, along with the Dennis the Menace uh, story that's also in your book, as well as your own coincidence, uh, form a kind of cultural uh, coincidence that I hope we, that we will get into after we go through this last um, this last segment, th this last uh, strand of the probability um, mm -hmm. principle, which I think is a, is a real tricky one because of, of the, the law of near enough. Um, yeah. So many people I, I, yeah. stretch two things that are pretty different. I know a guy uh, who wrote to me and said Christmas Eve took place both December 25th and January 4th, and therefore this coincidence was meaningful somehow. <laughs> and and, yeah. and I wrote yeah. back to him and said, who thinks it's January 4th? And I never heard back from him. But there were other things. He didn't need to throw that in there. But for him, that was the law of near enough. I mean, it's close yeah. enough yeah. to be the yeah. same thing. Exactly. Yeah. So that's exactly the law of near enough that if two of that if two events are regarded as close enough, you regard them uh, as identical. So and one of the, I'm just going to say one of the examples in the book is a man and his wife who are both involved in fatal train crashes, but different train crashes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, uh, in the UK, it's, rail travel is very safe. So you think that must be incredibly unlikely. What a coincidence. But it wasn't the man who was involved in both. It was the man and his wife. Had it been the man and his brother and cousin or cousin or workmate or son or daughter, 
you know, I'm, I'm increasing the range of possibilities and they're not identical. They're just near enough for people to say, what an amazing coincidence. If, if it, and here, here's another important point you're implying that if somewhere before either, either train crash, uh, someone had predicted it, you will each be involved with a train crash where you're specifying the people involved, uh, uh -huh. then the probabilities become much lower. Absolutely. That's a very, that's, a, that's another nice illustration of the, the law of um, truly large numbers. If you just said a, a train crash and someone will be killed, very different from saying a, chain, a train crash and this particular John Smith will be killed, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this, uh, yes. And that, that's, okay. Well, let's, let's, let's go to the, the coincidence involving uh, you and, uh, and John Ironmonger. Ah, yes, yes. So what happened here was, um, just as my book um, was published, I was contacted by a novelist, a fiction author named John Ironmonger, um, who, who um, told me um, that he was having a book published at the same time um, called Coincidence. In the UK, it's called The Coincidence Authority. Um, but in America, it's called Coincidence. And it was about a, uh, an authority on coincidences who lived in London. Uh, the romantic attachment was, based, was a, 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 a member of staff at London University, as my wife is. The birth date of this character in the book was the 30th of June, which is my birthday and so on. And what he, in fact he wanted to do, you know, he, he, he swore that he hadn't been stalking me and, and stealing my details from the web and using me, me for, for this character in his book. It was just a, an amazing coincidence that my book on this subject should come out just at the same time as his novel about someone with the same sort of characteristic. Just an amazing coincidence. That, that is, that is a, those are three different elements that are maybe independent. I mean, I don't, I think random is difficult to ver yeah. verify a lot of times. There's a lot more inter interdependence than we think so. But ber your, the birth date, uh, the College of London, again, it was your wife, not where, uh, where your wife works, not where the professor in the book worked. And they, the book came out around the same time that yours yeah, yeah, came yeah. out. That's a, those, that looks like a pretty low probability event. I, I think it is, but, but, well, it, yeah. it, it depends. You know, once we take into account the, the five laws, we can put it in perspective, I think. And books are particularly interesting in a number of ways for the improbability principle, because there are a lot of books published. You would expect coincidences like this to occur. You referred to um, Robertson's book, Futility, about the, the ship, the Titan, and, and, and the coincidence with the Titanic sinking. But there are other things like that. Um, uh, uh, I believe it was, I think it was a newspaper report, or it was, or, no, it was a story. De De Dennis about, the Menace, um, Dennis the Menace. Well, Dennis the Menace one, certainly. Two characters with the same name, two boys in, appearing in comic strips uh, in, in America and um, Britain at the same time, having no relationship, but the same, um, the same sort of physical characteristics, both possessing dogs and so on, and behaving in, in, in naughty sort of ways. Amazing coincidence. But another coincidence like this was there was a... a a story about the Manhattan Project it wasn't called the Manhattan Project, oh, yeah. but it was published just before um, the actual you know, Manhattan Project. And the, uh, the police went round to ask the author how he'd found out all these secrets and so on. It's just a coincidence. I, I think the point is that every year there are so many books and stories, radio plays, television plays, whatever, published that we're bound to get some of these coincidences. And that, of course, leads on to something I'm sure we'll talk about later. Once you've noticed them, they become a focus of attention. Yeah. You forget all the other millions of things which just didn't coincide and just focus attention on the, on the ones which did. And naturally, you say, isn't that incredible? Um, now one of the, one of the uh, ideas behind your book is to demonstrate that we do not need supernatural explanations for uh, a, a lot of these coincidences. And by yeah. supernatural, it's very clear you include uh, telepathy and precognition and clairvoyance. But when we talk about these books that uh, that have so much parallel with reality, 
um, it begins to look like something um, might be going on in the cultural mind. And I and I recommend. And so so I'm looking for explanations that aren't in this what you might call supernatural realm, but have something to do with uh, the consciousness of human beings, the evolution of human ideas. And and this is also illustrated uh, uh, in a parallel way with simultaneous discoveries. Because the simultaneous uh, yeah, yeah. discoveries, as you well know from from calculus and the telephone, uh, yeah. among many many other things, um, were were produced around the same time by people who were relatively independent, but feeding off some of the same cultural ideas. So I think these this becomes a kind of coincidence, including the Dennis the Menace one, that I think can be explained in uh, in more uh, more scientific terms that we haven't quite gotten to yet. I think that's exactly right, and I, I think your way of putting it is very good. It is a sort of Thank you. cultural commun- communality. We, we all live within within the particular society that we're in, so we're exposed to the same kind of influences and so yes. on. So naturally, we tend to think in the same sort of way. So it's not really surprising that, the, as you say, the phone was in, the telephone was invented by different people at the same time. And in, indeed, if you look at scientific stuff, relativity, for instance, I mean, it was just the way things were going. If Einstein yeah. hadn't done it, somebody else would have done it, I, I think. Um, and we're, com- and- we're, we're coming near to near the end of this uh, this segment, and I think this is an important um, a, a commonality where you and I are finding here that we can find an explanation that isn't necessarily what you would call supernatural. You are listening to Connecting with Coincidence with your host, Bernie Beitman, MD, on the X Zone Broadcast Network, and our guest is David Hand author of The Improbability Principle. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. 
It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back to CC with BB and our guest, David Hand, author of The Improbability Principle. We've gone through the five strands of The Improbability Principle, and now we're, we're beginning to talk about the possibility that coincidences sometimes indicate uh, an underlying uh, causal explanation that we can come to some agreement about. And one of those um, that's still ambiguous in the general um, scientific mind is the idea of of simultaneous discoveries, which I include the the the, the Dennis the Menace one, uh, because it 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 hit a cultural chord in both uh, in both nations and in, in Europe, in London, in, in England, and in the United States. But the difference in the Dennises were pretty was pretty funny because the Dennis in the United States was blonde and kind of stumbled into trouble. Each of them had a dog, and the one in London was a bad boy. And he did the stuff exactly. on purpose. And his, he and his dog were out to make trouble on purpose. Yeah. And they, they reflect cultural differences, but they they are about a boy and his dog causing trouble. And there's something there's something without trying to be able to say how that works that's in the in the air. Ideas that are in the air that people who are creative pull out of the air somehow and then make it possible for the rest of us to see. Yeah, I, I think that's right. At a, at a very trivial level, that's illustrated by the sheer names, Dennis the Menace. I yes. mean, if you were going to come up with a, a name for a character of the kind you've just described, that's a pretty straightforward sort of choice. So, you know, not really surprising um, that they came up with, with, with coincident names, I think. But at a, at a deeper level, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the causality thing is interesting because it's not one of them causing the other. They both have a mutual common cause. That, yes. That's, I think, the thing. Yes. Um, we were talking um, earlier about uh, well, the strands that Percy Diaconus, uh, mm -hmm. I think, introduced into the lexicon, the, the, the law of truly uh, mm -hmm. large right. numbers. Um, yeah. And we were talking about how the question of how large is large enough <laughs> Uh, because I, I can I can see how that law of truly large numbers uh, could could embrace uh, eternity. Um, that that's that's long enough. I mean, yeah. where does the law stop? Where is truly large not that large? Uh, yeah. Where does truly large stop? Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good question. Um, and it has to be said that in, for some situations, truly large doesn't have to be large at all. It can be could be as small as 100. But yes. normally, and, and, and it depends on the size of the probability that you're looking at. You know, if you're looking at a tiny probability, then you'll need lots and lots of opportunities for the thing to occur to, to make the probability mount up. But in other situations, if you're looking at something which where the probability of it occurring is not that small, then you don't actually need a vast number of possibilities, possible opportunities for it. It's, so, it's, a, it's a flexible number. And, yeah, exactly. and yeah. when I see a word like the law, and I right. think of the law of large numbers for which there is, uh, is a mathematical proof. I can't follow it. You can, but I can't. But there is a mathematical proof for the law of large numbers, namely that you do enough uh, repetitions, you're going to get to the hypothetical uh, average um, yeah. or hypothetical outcome. But there's no proof of the law of truly large numbers. It's a plausible argument. And so I have, I have trouble calling both of those laws. Well, I think if oh, this, this relates to what you said at the beginning, the problem of finding base rates and so on. Um, yes. And in situations where you can, then you can actually work out the, the actual what, what a truly large number will be. So, for instance, let's take the American Powerball um, lottery, where, again, lotteries, we can work out the base rates. I think at the moment this is a 569 plus 126 lottery. You have to choose five numbers out of 69 
and one out of 26 for, for each ticket, which means there are about 300 million possible different tickets. And you can do a little bit of maths on that. And, and if you buy, for instance, one ticket a week for four million years, then you've got a 50-50 chance of winning the jackpot. So that <laughs> gives you four million years. Four million times 52 weeks in a year is the truly large number I'm talking about there. <laughs> so that actually gives you the, the sort of magnitude uh, of truly large in that context. In other contexts, like being struck by a meteorite or something, yeah, difficult to work out. It's going to be a long time. It's going to be a lot of opportunities. It's going to be a pretty large number with a lot of zeros after it. But it's difficult to actually put a number on it. Yeah. I, I guess maybe you're answering my question here, but uh, for an event, take an event that has a very low probability. Um, that when does that probability become so low that it falls outside the law of truly large numbers? Yeah, I think that that, that is a, a very nice question, a very subtle one as well. I think because. My first answer, my immediate response is it never becomes so low. You just give, make the truly large number. Even <laughs> That's truly what I thought. Yeah. That's but what on I the saw. other hand, when the probability is such that it, it wouldn't be a question of going for 4 million years, but for 400 billion years, the universe is only 14 billion years old. So, you know, if you go, go for long enough, it becomes you're, you're so unlikely to experience it in the whole history of the universe you might as well regard it as impossible. Then, then the probability is so small, you might as well regard it as outside the scope of well, truth. That's, that's Burrell's law, I think, as exactly. you were talking exactly. about it. But yeah. I'm talking about an event, the actual event, not a hypothetical event, right. but a, a, an event that with a very, very low probability. And here we come into the problem that I'm running into, is how do you determine the probability of some of these lack of base rates events? And let me give you, let me give you a simple example that is from my experience. I was... I was talking uh, with a friend of mine who I only see when I'm walking around in the woods, and she had a friend that I had never met before, and uh, his name he introduced is, is Cleve something or other from Cleveland, uh, and we were talking, I was talking with him, I was talking with her for a while, and uh, for some reason I went into a brief reverie and had an image of a friend of mine from high school whose nickname was George, it wasn't his real name, but it was, his nickname was George, so I blew blurted out the name George to this Cleveland guy, yeah. and he said, how did you know? Because that was his given <laughs> name. George was his given name. Well, 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 yeah. Well, well, what do, you, you, what yeah. do you do with that? Right. My first reaction is, yes, difficult to get exact baselines. You, you could start to get sort of ballpark figures by sort of how many people are called George, how many people mm -hmm. live in Cleveland, these, these sorts of things. But they would be very rough and approximate, very much ballpark figures. Um, but I don't think the, when, it, when it comes down to it, I don't think the probability would be that low. It would be sufficiently low that it isn't surprising in the whole population of the United States to find those sorts of things occurring. It's, it's that I was able to do it at the moment of talking with them. It's not that how many Georges are, yeah, are there from yeah, Cleveland yeah, only. Yeah, it's yeah. that I could name that name at that moment at while time, I'm yes. talking with him. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that, that adds an additional uh, event, a timing event, where I, I play, pay a lot of attention to timing as a, a, as a variable in determining or at least guessing about a probability. So that timing yeah. was just right for that circumstance circumstance and that that makes the probability yet lower to me it does i entirely agree um but again i think we have to put this in the context of all the other situations like that where the coincidence didn't occur they said george and you and you know it was harry not george sort of thing. but I, I but i haven't done that and i've had three other circumstances oh, yeah. that i can remember where i have done that with someone where i've said something of, to them about them that they haven't told me yeah I'm, I'm, but there will be lots of, not just you, but lots of other people who've had those sorts of conditions, those circumstances where, they, where it hasn't been a coincidence. Yes. That, plus um, another thing which we, we should come to, which is, of course, once it happens, you notice it. You, yes. You, you, you pay attention to it. You remember it. And, yes. And in the book, I talk about psychics taking advantage of this sort of thing, you know, making lots of predictions and people naturally remember the ones that they got right. And the psychics draw attention to the ones they yes. got right. Yes. Um, 
and, and forget about the others. Why indeed would anybody remember the others? You know, um, and so I think there's a there's a sort of a distortion, a sort of selection bias going on in, in our minds. Um, my mind as well. You know, everybody's minds. We naturally focus on things which appear to have meaning. Uh, it's, uh, there's a couple of things to get to for our next segment. We have a couple of minutes left in this, but let, let me ask a fundamental existential question of you um, about your view of the nature of reality. Um, uh, <laughs> because I, I think it, <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we, we have one more segment. Yeah. Um, but I'll put it in simple. I'll put it in simple terms um, that I have the f- belief and the feeling and experience that there is meaning out there to be discovered. That it's not just that um, that's one alternative in existential understanding of meaning, that there's meaning out there. Another is that there is no meaning. Yeah. And related to that is if there's meaning, we make it up. It's mm-hmm. not really out there. And mm-hmm. then there's the combination of it's some out there and we make it up. Where are you on that, that existential question? I suppose I believe in a an underlying reality. There is something out there which we can discover. Um, but I think for, for, for the sorts of things we're talking about now, probability and chance and coincidences, we basically have discovered it. Uh, the mathematics explains it, plus the sorts of things we were talking about a moment ago, the human tendency to focus on things which appear to have meaning for us. So I think we've basically discovered the reality for these sorts of things. But yes, I believe in an underlying reality. Ah, okay. And, and it's a statistical reality is what you're, what you're talking about. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll come back to that. And we want to get back to how to use your information with the lottery in our next segment. So <laughs> yes. uh, you are listening to uh, Connecting with Coincidence with your host, Dr. Bernie Buckman, MD. And that is me on the Exxon Broadcast Network. And our guest today is author of The Improbability Principle Statistician, David Hand. have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well it is, but you can have it today right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci-Fi and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. 
The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork, we'll take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back to CC with BB, Connecting with Coincidence, with your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. That is me, and our guest is David Hand, and we are talking about the simple question of the ex- existential existential meaning in life. And David, what I'm trying to suggest is that the, is that the simultaneous discovery idea, which f- at first looks like an amazing coincidence, and who knows how it happened, and you can get all kinds of speculation about how it happened, that there is an underlying way of understanding it, that we can explain it, and that science has pre- preceded, uh, and particularly uh, pharmacological uh, uh, discoveries, and by coincidences, by serendipity for the most part, and there's no greater example uh, of uh, serendipity in in, in, in medicine and pharmacology than the discovery of penicillin. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. and I'm not trying to be able to get into that with you. I would like to do that perhaps another time. But to, to read that story and to see how many things had to happen to go from Alexander Fleming and his nose drippings to the production of penicillin in 1944 or so uh, in, in World War II, that remarkable number of things had to happen. I don't have an explanation for them, but it looks like this one is one that requires a very large uh, set of numbers to be, be able to encompass and one that m- might take a, 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 at least several minutes. Million, several million years to do, but that that's a that's a question for another time. Okay. What I'm trying to suggest to you is this: my thinking is that we can look at coincidences as uh, sometimes, and not a lot of times, but sometimes a rev- giving us hints about underlying uh, explanations that we have yet to be considering as scientists. I I, I think that's a very nice point because. Although the improbability explains why we should expect coincidences to occur, that doesn't mean that when a coincidence does occur, there isn't some explanation for it. Um, nah, you know, yeah. So, so, and, and there, I have many examples of, of scientific discoveries where people thought that's odd, isn't it? What's going on there? And you know, it could be a coincidence, could be just chance, random fluctuation, bad measurements, and these sorts of things. But it could also be a, a discovery. Um, yeah. The discovery of pulses is like that. Um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell uh, noticed some strange patterns in, in the radio telescope traces and went on to discover pulses as, as a consequence of that. She could have said just, oh, well, it's just random noise, just random events, sort of coincidences. I can ignore it. Um, and there are many cases like that in science. So when something odd occurs, scientists should investigate. Yeah. And um, most of the time, maybe, you know, nothing there. But yeah. <laughs> if there is something there, that's a Nobel Prize. Well, that, and, and that's where I am going with coincidence studies. There's a lot that needs to be uh, put aside, but there are some that are revealing to me something that of an underlying uh, ex- explanation that we have yet to come up to. And this this comes to another question of, for you. Does our understanding uh, of why coincidences occur in a statistical way mean the magic goes away? Oh, that's a very nice question. Um yeah, I'm often asked that. You know, I'm, I'm a statistician. I believe I can explain why these things occur, why we should expect them to occur as we go through life. So is my world a grey, drab world like British weather? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is no, it isn't. And the, the, the parallel, the analogy I usually give is, is the rainbow. Before, you know, when you don't understand why and how a rainbow works, you walk outside and you see this arch of colours going across the sky. And you think, wow, isn't that incredible? But when you do understand the physics behind it, when you understand light, how light reflects and refracts around inside the raindrops to produce the colors, you don't think that's boring when you see a rainbow. You think even more. Isn't that amazing? I understand now the complexity, the sheer, you know, sort of immensity of what's going on in there, which makes it even more exciting. It and does. I think the same is true. The same is true of, of coincidences. When they happen to me and, and my. Once you start to study these things, they you pay attention. So they 
seem to happen more and more. Yeah. And once they happen to me, I, I think, wow, isn't that wonderful? And add it to my list of coincidences that have happened to me. <laughs> what? Can't hear you. I, c I can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, so, yeah, you've come back now. Um, You've had a lot of coincidences happen to you because you started paying attention to coincidences. Exactly, exactly. exactly. One of my nicest, I think, was in 2012. I um, I went to the Royal Statistical Society conference in Telford, which is a town uh, in, in the north of England, and um, I went up to the reception desk to register. And I said, my name's David Hand. And the receptionist looked at her a screen. Oh, there's another David Hand here. Exactly, exactly. There's, a, there's another David Hand. And she said, which one are you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm the one that's standing in front of you, man. <laughs> that's right, I'm the real one. <laughs> but, but then I went to look at how many David Hands there were. There are about 300 in America. So, you know, and given how many conferences I go to, hotels I stay in and so on, it's not that unlikely that I should. Yeah. Meet my, but, but that doesn't mean that when I when that happened and subsequently I didn't think, wow, isn't that exciting? Imagine meeting another person with my same, the same name. Yeah. yeah. And, and we can extend that further to doppelgangers uh, with people who, who share multiple characteristics in common who run into each other. Beside, but not not a name necessarily, but sometimes, but uh, yeah, yeah. other characteristics that uh, become quite remarkable and seem like low probability events. And well, well, just to be cl clear with you, with me, uh, we are both talking about low probability events and and how to understand them. Yeah. And for me, the lowest, the lower the probability, the more uh, I want to look for an explanation. Yeah, I think that's yeah. probably, yeah, that's fair enough, because if you take it to a less extreme level, you know, if you'd expect it to happen a lot, you wouldn't you wouldn't be seeking an explanation. It's when they become less and less likely, you think, hmm, there's something funny going on here. Yeah. Hey, that's the one. That's the one. Um, and do you find that have you found people who are more or less probability? I mean, more or less coincidence prone people who experience a lot of them. There are people like that, and, and you would expect there to be, again, 7 billion people in the world. Yeah, some yeah. people would have, but, but also, of course, once some people just keep an eye open for these things and notice them more than others. So you would expect this distribution. You would expect yeah. some people who never experienced such things, other people who experience them all the time. And in fact, I, I regularly get emails from people um, uh, saying, you know, all of these things have happened to me. What does it mean? Um, yeah. And what it means is they, they are alert for coincidences. Um, and, and because they've had a lot in the past doesn't necessarily mean they'll have a lot in the future, other than the fact that they're alert for them. I saw a normal distribution suddenly appear in my mind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, yes. Let's, let's, let's perhaps end with a little practicality. Uh, how, can, uh, how can our listeners use this understanding to win the lottery? Thank you. Say it out again, but assuming you can hear me. Um, okay, but there, there are two two basic principles. One is you should never you should always choose your numbers at random. Um, you shouldn't use uh, birthdays or the pattern of numbers on the form you fill in to choose the numbers or whatever. You should use a random pick, a lucky dip, whatever it's called. Um, because if you use them according to a birthdays or a formula the chances are that other people will use the same formula uh, and so you will win less should you happen to win the jackpot. So, for instance, the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six in many lotteries are chosen by thousands of people each time. So um, don't don't choose numbers according to a particular pattern. Use a random pick each time. And, and how does it. how does one do random? Oh, most lotteries have a, a, a facility for allowing you to choose at, oh. ran, ran, okay. at random. It might be called lucky dip, or lucky dip, or random pick, or something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, that's the first thing, um, and and a consequent one consequence of that is you shouldn't use the same numbers each week. And there are terribly sad cases of people who use the same numbers each week, and then um, one week they didn't. There aren't many cases like this, but <laughs> coincidence, we would expect it. Um, oh gosh. You can see where this is going. Yeah, they were in a rush to pack for their holiday, so they didn't buy the ticket that week, and then they won, and then they had to kill themselves. Um, but, uh, we, we have about two minutes left, David. Okay. The other way is to buy all the lottery tickets. 
the UK National Lottery has um, it's a it's a 159. There are 45 million different tickets. So and they cost two pounds each. So if you've got to spare 90 million pounds, you can buy them all up. Guarantee winning the jackpot. Not a good idea because there may be other people holding the winning tickets. You might have to share it. And so on. <laughs> you should always buy only on rollovers when the jackpot is built up to make that sort of thing worthwhile. And I have to say that a number of groups actually did that. They actually waited until the jackpot had rolled over and then bought all the tickets or tried to. Um, so this is uh, has been done in the past. Um, so that's those, those are they may not be very practical ways, but they are ways you can. <laughs> guarantee winning the lottery or win guarantee winning more should you win <laughs> um there's i have more questions but the my fundamental question that we're not going to be able to answer that i'm having to wrestle with and i would hope to have some uh, help from you about is to ta taking uh, coincidences that don't have obvious base rates yeah. And being able to have some kind of principle or set of principles by which to make uh, an, a, an educated guess about what the probability of that particular coincidence might be. Because yeah. what I'm doing is developing a taxonomy of coincidences, uh, descriptors, that, uh, descriptions of coincidences, um, themes of coincidence stories, oh, um, yes. explanations. There's a wide variety of explanations out there, which for me, statistics is fundamental. It's a, it's a fundamental part of every coincidence and we yeah. need to be able to determine that well but for me there are more elements to it than just pro the, just the probability and right. I add those and then also how to use coincidences we've come to the end of this David thank you very very much for being my guest you've been listening to connecting with coincidence with your host Bernie Beitman MD and our wonderful guest David Hand. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. 
He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.